Hi everyone. Uh, I'm just about to get started. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Eyal Eisenberg. Uh, I'm an engineering team leader here at uh, Wix. And I also manage the new Hyper branch. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank everybody for joining from uh, all over the world. Uh, hope you're safe and uh, staying at home. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, this is me and my wonderful team uh, here in Haifa. Um, we are from the OS team at Wix, uh, mainly responsible for uh, the back office at Wix and uh, mainly the dashboard. And this is what we're going to focus on mostly um, during this talk. Um, we have uh, engineering locations uh, all over the world, uh, in Ukraine, Israel, and Lithuania. Uh, like I said, I'm from uh, Haifa, our newest branch. And what we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about how to build a very complex uh, web page for big scale traffic. Uh, when I wrote this presentation, it was 170 million website editors. And now it's uh, more like 200 million. So this number is growing rapidly. Um, so let's begin with a small uh, case study, as we say. Uh, let's talk about John. Uh, John is a photographer, and he's a Wix user. And when he first uh, started his site, he needed to boost his site uh, through different uh, widgets and apps. Uh, so, for example, he's a, he's a photographer, so he has a photo album, and he has a blog because he needs to write about it. He handles his contact. He also sells his pictures online. And back in the day, uh, before we uh, get into what we are doing right now, this was our, our, our back office. Basically, you had this, uh, this entry page right here, something similar to this, and it brought you into uh, multiple back offices. And you can already see that um, just these are the sidebars of each one of these back offices. And and this was problematic because um, each each time John or the customer wanted to go from one page to another, um, he had a completely different experience, uh, not only from a UI perspective, but also um, from an engineering perspective, uh, things were completely different. Um, the, UX, the UX was completely different and this was problematic and let alone from an engineering standpoint, this was very complicated to maintain and was a, a very poor experience because he was in one back office, for, for example, for photo albums, then he wanted to go into context, he had to go back out and then back in, and this was very problematic. Um, so then we decided this was a, a major problem and we wanted to build one, basically one back office to, to roll them all, as they say. Um, so this was the business manager. Um, this was a very big uh, <clears throat> engineering uh, UX and product effort that we did uh, roughly roughly two years ago, I would say. And the main idea here was that we wanted to basically have one back office, the business manager, and in it, all these um, companies here at Wix, for example, the photo albums, the booking services, uh, e-commerce, and so on, they would integrate into the business manager and then they could uh, showcase their own um, pages inside this one back office. Um, pretty quickly when we started working on this, we realized that we needed uh, a dashboard. Basically, we wanted to have a place where we would show uh, our users, we would show them the critical information that they need to see when they go uh, into Wix, basically, into their back office. Uh, this was, for example, the common action that they common actions that they needed to do um, from our from from Wix's perspective, uh, banners that will um, pr uh, provoke you will not provoke you, will basically push you to update your your account to a premium account, uh, and and various tools that are common practices like uh, sending emails and so on. Um, the common actions they were basically um, Stuff which was across all the different um, companies and what we call verticals at Wix. And there were common stuff like easily sending emails, automatic response, designing logos. This was no matter what you had installed in your application. Uh, this is stuff that you needed and we, we thought that you were, it, was, it, would be, it would be beneficial for you to do it. 
uh, in order for you to succeed as a business. Uh, but some stuff uh, we just showed you if you had the specific uh, vertical installed. Now I said vertical and also horizontals. This is basically what we mean. And when we say a vertical is like something that's uh, just for your site at this moment, and it, it's just specific for uh, specific uh, information uh, and utilities that you want to use. For example, e-commerce or bookings, um, restaurants, and so on. And horizontals are stuff which are across and common to all these verticals. So contacts in e-com are the same contacts that you use in booking and in photo albums, and they are, everything is connected between them. So in this dashboard, we also had information which was uh, custom, custom shown only for you if you had a specific vertical. So for example, this is a blog. So if you had a blog, you would see this information. Um, the architecture of the, the dashboard 1.0, uh, it was a React uh, application with the Redux and TypeScript. Uh, we do TypeScript everywhere we can at Wix. And basically it was one app and it had um, NPM dependencies on the different uh, stuff that you, what we wanted to show in this dashboard. And everything was bundled into it. And then we would show the relevant stuff for you according to the information we got uh, from uh, across the systems at Wix of what's relevant to show to you. Um, one of the uh, cool things we, we did right from the get-go was uh, we wanted to improve uh, perceived performance. Um, perceived performance is, um, I'm going to say it a lot in, during this pr presentation, uh, it's something very important and it's uh, used everywhere. And you, you, even if you don't know this term, you obviously already know what this means. Um, a lot of times you would go to websites and they would show you like, like in this case here, just like a spinner that goes on and on and on. And this makes you feel like the website is very, very slow and nothing is changing. Uh, and what we did was that after this spinner show was shown to you for a few seconds or less, depending on your connection, we would switch over to showing these skeletons and you would already get a feel for what the application was going to look like. So with that being said, perceived performance is not how fast your website actually is, but how fast it seems to be. So even if it took the exact same amount of time, if you saw this for five seconds, uh, in, as opposed to seeing this for two seconds and this for three seconds, this feels like website is much faster and things are happening. Uh, you have examples of this at Facebook, Slack, everywhere you go, you see it all the time. It makes everything feels much, much faster. Um, but it had issues, uh, this dashboard. So first of all, performance, uh, it was one big project and this was very problematic. Uh, just the uh, dependency uh, for the site details, uh, site details is, uh, um, a widget that's shown here with uh, basic information on your site and common action. Just this uh, widget here was 115 kilobytes. And I know what you're thinking to yourself, what's 115 kilobytes? I mean, we're sending pictures over uh, WhatsApp or whatever for uh, several megabytes and it's, uh, it's nothing. But you need to take into, into consideration that your customers are not don't necessarily have a fast connection. Wix is a big company. We have a, a roughly 200 million users, and many of them are not in, in countries or in cities, or sometimes they're even you know checking their site on the train or on the mobile, and uh, the connection is not so great. So 115 kilobytes can have a, a, a big difference. That's why we try to shed every kilobyte that we can when we are optimizing for performance. So this was problematic because we had here uh, six or so widgets, each one of them roughly 100 kilobytes plus the core of the project itself. So the bundle itself was like 600 kilobytes, which was not not small. Um, perceived performance, uh, it, like I said, it was a, it was a big up, uh, upgrade compared to what it was before with uh, just that spinner going round and round. However, um, the way it was designed back then was that um, all these skeletons were shown until all the widgets were ready to, to load and to show their information. So basically, if you had one widget which loaded uh, 
roughly at uh, let's say uh, two seconds and the slowest one loaded at six seconds, we would switch over the entire page from showing skeletons to showing the actual page uh, after six seconds because the weakest, uh, the slowest widget would set the tone. Um, from a product standpoint, we also had a problem here that uh, if you had many uh, verticals or applications installed on your site, uh, we would show setup uh, steps um, for your site. For example, if you have if you had e-commerce, we would say, okay, you have to add a product, you have to show uh, select shipping regions, uh, your currency, how to accept payments, and so on. So. No, um, with regards of how many uh, applications you had installed on your site, you had many steps. So if you had three verticals, which is not something huge because main funnel basically it means you have no verticals, so there's like the default steps. You had three big widgets with steps on what you needed to do, and they would push everything else below the fold, which automatically meant that our customers were less exposed to everything under the fold. So this was problematic. And from a complexity standpoint, well, this is a tweet that I love to show about Redux from Dan Abamov. Uh, he's the creator of Redux. And don't get me wrong, I, I, I used to be a very big fan of Redux, and I still think it's great depending on what you need to do. And even uh, Dan here, and this is not so long ago, this is from November, even he uh, basically wrote, reading some Redux code example I wrote four years ago, and I have no idea what's going on there. And and it's true. Uh, when you have a Redux project, you start out, you know exactly what what's going on, but it gets com more complex. And especially when you bring on uh, new developers, especially ones which are also new to Redux, it's very hard to bring them into the project. Um, and the onboarding process for them is very difficult. So onward to Dashboard, dashboard 2.0. So Dashboard 2.0 was a, a, big, uh, a big and significant change for us. And if you go to Wix.com right now, this is pretty similar to what you're going to see right now. Uh, we are in the process of uh, doing Dashboard 3.0. And we'll get to that uh, a little later in the presentation. Um, you can see the main difference that you'll see here is um, this widget over here. We call this the setup widget or Omni setup. That's the internal name for it. Basically, uh, this is a setup which changes according to which kind of applications you have installed on your site. And basically took all those widgets that I showed you earlier and crammed them into one widget uh, with all the setup information that you needed to, to know in order to uh, succeed at your business. Um, let's talk about, first of all, the performance issues that we had. So as you see here in the image, we have uh, several separate widgets. And the great thing about them is that we did them all as lazy components. Um, lazy components, um, uh, I know that from previous times I did this presentation that um, many people don't use them or don't know what they are. So I think it's very important that um, you use this tool in your everyday programming, especially for large applications. Um, and let's see why. So a lazy component, basically you have the parent, in our case, the dashboard. And let's say it wants to render uh, this widget here, the site details. So instead of bundling the entire site details into the dashboard, bundle, like we said earlier, it was 115 kilobytes, something like that. You only bundle a small chunk um, of this, of the site details into the dashboard, what we call uh, the lazy component wrapper as, or any other name that you feel is appropriate to something that's not actually the, the lazy component. So this wrapper is very small. It's uh, only a few kilobytes and it's bundled inside the dashboard. And when the render function of the dashboard, it gets to this, um, to the site details lazy component wrapper. Basically, it would start to fetch the bundle. Nothing would be rendered. And in the background, the bundle begins to be fetched from the web. Once this, um, once this bundle arrived, the content would render. 
And in our case, what we did was we wrapped these lazy components uh, in a card component. Um, uh, we wrapped this, these uh, lazy components in a card component. We basically showed a skeleton while this bundle was being fetched in the background. Once the bundle arrived, that's when uh, the, the bundle would be evaluated. And then the component would tell, the lazy component would tell us, the parent, uh, I'm ready to show my, uh, my content. And then that skeleton would disappear and the widget itself would be shown. And this was, this is obviously great because, you know, we didn't bundle, uh, almost anything at the parent. And then the parent's uh, bundle size is much, much smaller. And then it can load fast. We have better perceived performance. We already show you these skeletons. And then we start to fetch the stuff in the background. So some of the benefits of lazy component, I went over them, but let's uh, go over them one by one. So it's many small bundles instead of one big one. So it's much easier for incremental performance. Um, what I mean by that is when you fetch, when the browser fetches a, a bundle or a CSS, um, basically once it fetched it once, it's now caching it. So what we have, basically, if we have, um, if we had one big bundle like we had before and you did a change in this site details widget, basically that whole bundle needed to change. And it means that all your users, all these 200 million users, the next time they'll go into the dashboard, they need to re-download this 700K all over again, just for that small change in that specific widget. So instead, you have, we broke that apart to seven small bundles. And if you had a change in the site details, only that widget would change. So when you go back into the dashboard, you get a uh, 304 redirect, uh, sorry, 301 from uh, the browser saying that this is already cached. And you basically, you read, you don't need to download all of these bundles all over again. You just, you just uh, re-download the bundle of site details and everything is much faster. So only that small piece of code needs to be, get re-downloaded. Um, there is much higher confidence in deploying, uh, individual microservices because you only need to test and check that specific widget that you know you've, you've changed. You don't need to check everything. You don't, I only touch this part. I'm only deploying this part, and this is what I need to check. Um, also from um, testing the integration or unit test, it's also much easier. You know that you only need to focus on one part. You don't, you don't have a suite of thousands of thousands of tests. You only have a suite which, which is specific to your, uh, to your uh, application, to what's actually being deployed. From a perceived performance uh, standpoint, it's, it's obvious that, uh, like I said, everything else would load fast because the bundle is already there. And only that specific widget that you've changed, only this one will load slightly slower than the rest, but it needs to re-download. Um, separate, so another thing we did for perceived performance was we, we separated the skeletons. So if you remember in dashboard one, we had one big skeleton. And even though it looked similar to what uh, you would see uh, in the dashboard now, if you go, uh, that these all, all the widgets would be, would be like a skeleton like this one. However, they are separate, meaning that every widget when it's ready independently would tell, uh, would tell the parent, I am ready, show me instead of this skeleton. And then you would get a situation that basically all these widgets would start popping, switching from skeletons to content. And whoever is slowest uh, in this specific image, it was the setup widget, it would change when it's ready. So this uh, feels like everything is much faster. Uh, from a product standpoint, like I said, we, uh, we put together all these setup widgets into one uh, big setup widget. and. And it, it was a huge success uh, from conversion standpoint and from completing this, the steps uh, that we recommend for the, our sites, for our users to complete on their sites and basically help them succeed with their business. Um, from a dev velocity standpoint, this was a, a very big uh, success for us because uh, now instead of having all our devs on one big project uh, and st stepping over each other, now we, we had them spread across multiple projects, multiple small projects, 
we had each dev would have his own project, usually with another one to have like a backup, a backup for him. Because it's small projects, you don't need many, many maintainers of it. We only had uh, one or two uh, maintainers, uh, obviously with others uh, supporting, but the, the two tech leads on him. And, and since it's a small project, it's easy to, to make changes. It's easy to, to, to work with it. It's easy to even, even to start the project and to run the test suite locally. It's much nicer to do it with a suite of 100, 200 tests rather than a thousand or 2000 tests. Um, another great thing we did was that we switched to Wix serverless. Um, this is basically a internal serverless tool that we have at Wix. It's, Pretty much the same as uh, Amazon Lambda or IBM's or uh, Azure or any one of those uh, services. It's the same idea. Um, the only difference is it's internal for us at Wix and it already has um, the built-in common tools that we use at Wix. For example, authorizations or permissions and all that stuff. It's already uh, cooked inside, so we don't need to invest uh, much time in it. And this is really great. This was really great for us. And this is something I really encourage uh, other uh, front end developers to do. Um, so my team started as completely uh, feds. We only, we had uh, four or five uh, front end developers. And each time we needed to do a, a server task, we had to ask uh, from a server developer to, to, to hop in. Or even worse, we would try to figure out ways like to circumvent going to the server and try to solve everything in the client side. And this was problematic because it made the client side uh, more complicated. We had to do all these weird promise alls with a chunk of promises. And it, it wasn't a nice thing to do. And once we started using the serverless, um, since it's so easy and you don't have to think about it, and this is true for other other services as well, it's the, it's the same point. It's so easy to start a serverless project um, that you don't even have to think about it. It's like, okay, I can do this complicated in the client or send a, a small request to a serverless function and do everything I need there quickly, um, le reduce the load from the client and move it to the server, do it over there and, and send it back to the client. So this was great for us and basically it pivoted our team completely from being fed to being full stack. And even now we are recruiting full stacks. We don't require, we don't recruit feds anymore. We recruit full stacks. Uh, and this was a really great turning point uh, in my team. Um, so I want to talk about some common issues and optimizations that uh, we noticed um, through, during this process. It wasn't all uh, amazing right from the get go. So the first thing that we noticed was that um, you had a problem with these lazy components. Uh, like I said before, the parents started load, uh, loading the lazy component wrapper and, and it started downloading the, the bundle. And once that bundle arrived, um, the component wasn't ready yet because 99% of these uh, widgets or applications needed to fetch additional data to show uh, the content. It wasn't just enough to, to load the bundle. It needs to load data from other services. So uh, what, we, what, what was happening was that the bundle arrived and then another call from within this widget was made to start fetching the data. And only once that data arrived, the component rendered its content and told the parent, I'm ready. And only then the skeleton would switch over from the skeleton to the content. And this was probably problematic. Basically, this was a synchronous process of downloading one file and then requesting data from a server. So the solution for this was simultaneous fetching. Basically, what we did was that we started fetching the data and the bundle at the same time. And once both of them arrived, then the component would render. And as expected, this cut the render time for all these widgets by about uh, 50%. It was much faster, uh, especially for um, for repeat renders, uh, for uh, because the bundle was already there, the, the browser would uh, return that uh, the, uh, the JavaScript and CSS uh, was already downloaded before, and only the data needed to be retrieved. Uh, and this was fast, so it was very, very fast, and it was a great solution for us. Uh, another issue that we was we were facing was increased bundle size due to duplicate dependencies. 
So we had all these widgets uh, and everything was going great. Um, but we noticed that many of them were pretty big and we noticed that they were all using, uh, reusing the same libraries over and over. And um, you can see here, I kind of, yeah, I tried to articulate this by diff uh, by these color blocks. And basically what was happening was that this widget was bringing the same dependency that this one was, and this one was, and this one was. And this was a waste. And we wanted to see how we can solve that. So basically what we did was we extracted these common packages and code into the dashboard bundle itself. We split that dashboard into two parts. One was the dashboard, which was responsible for loading these widgets. And the second part was the dashboard API, which held common services for the widgets to use and also common codes that they could reuse. So in there, we put, for example, packages like uh, Axios uh, for uh, Ajax requests or the BI loggers that we use or, or uh, event loggers and so on. Uh, even uh, the translation tools, IAT, Next, and all that stuff, we put it there and then all these widgets would reuse them. Now I know what you're gonna say, hey, but doesn't extracting all this stuff into the dashboard basically slowed you down? So it's true and untrue. So yes, it made the bundle a little bigger for the dashboard itself. However, since the dashboard itself and dashboard API is the platform, we don't deploy it as much as these widgets. The widgets keep on changing and there are new features and new experiments and new tests that we want to do all the time. But the platform itself doesn't change that often. So uh, once we extracted all these uh, packages and, and service utilities into the dashboard, yes, all the users needed to re-download the bundle for the dashboard again. But since that doesn't change that much, then um, the, the JavaScript of the bundle would get cached all the time. And then the, from that point on, the benefit was uh, clear that from this moment on, all these uh, uh, packages don't need to be re-downloaded again. So that was actually a great, great plus as well. Um, another thing that we noticed was the increased bundle size due to translations. So Wix uh, is available in many, many, uh, many, many countries and many, many languages. Um, uh, just from this uh, screenshot here, you can see that we have mes messages, basically is the files of translation. Uh, you can see that it's in, uh, I think there's like 30 languages here, something like that. And this tool is probably one of the most important tools, in my opinion, that, uh, that a JavaScript developer uh, needs to know, especially in the front end, obviously. So, this is the bundle analyzer, the Webpack bundle analyzer. This is basically built in if you're using Webpack, it's there. Uh, and there are, it's one of the best tools that you can and you can and should use in order to realize what's making the bundle size of your application big. So I ran this tool on just one of those um, components uh, at your dashboard. And I noticed that we were bundling all these JSON files of the languages. And you can see here that just this thing is 126 kilobytes just for these locales, all these messages. So obviously if you're viewing the site in English, you, there's no point in bringing the translations of, uh, I don't know, Russian or Italian into this, uh, into the bundle. So the solution was that we, um, we extracted the translations to a different um, endpoint in the bundle. And then we would fetch only the necessary translations according to the language that you were using. So if you were using English, we would, we would request only English from the, uh, from the CDN. And basically that made the bundle much, much, uh, smaller. So you can see here, it's the same, uh, dialogue and it was, it decreased by, uh, 130 kilobytes just by doing this. Uh, bonus points, and this is something that we are now it's basically becoming mandatory because it's so great. Um, we're, we're making the translations deployable. Uh, what, th what this means is that we're not only separating the, the bundle, uh, from the translation, we're making a translation, a deployable project in our internal deploy tools. And this means that, that we as developers, we only need to put the keys, um, 
of the translation in our application. And the content writers, they can update them as they see fit and, and as they need. And they don't even need to talk to us to redeploy these translations. They just press a button and it's there. They can test it and, the, and they can make it available for everybody. And we, don't, we are completely out of this process and it's great. It's awesome for our velocity. Uh, another serious issue that we were facing was browser throttling. So uh, many microservices, basically it means that there are many, many network calls. And HTTP 1 uh, limits the browsers to six concurrent requests to the same host. And I was actually pretty shocked when, <laughs> when I saw this initially. Uh, because it meant that uh, we were slowing down our application very much because of this. And basically what happened was that the first six requests, like let's say 20 requests are being made from, this, from the client, and the first six would start, and only once the, each one of them would finish, the next one would start over. So it was kind of like a waterfall, I would say, and, until everything was ready, and then everything was great. So here I have a couple of screenshots. Um, this is in HTTP 1, and I'm actually using um, a Chrome uh, DevTools here, and you'll see at different speeds. And this is online, so it means no throttling. Uh, this is one request that I'm making here. And you can see that it's stalling for half a second uh, and then doing the, the transfer of data itself. So it's, the total is 100, uh, 813 milliseconds, but 500 of these were just waiting to start. So it's only the, the transaction itself is only 300 uh, milliseconds, but it took almost a second just because of it. Uh, let's see what happens when you go to slower speeds. So here I was simulating fast 3G, and you can see is that the time here for stalling is much, much greater now. This is uh, almost a second and a half. And if I go to low 3G, this is a very dramatic uh, difference now. It's almost five seconds stalling, plus two, two seconds for the connection itself. So it was seven seconds just for this. And this is slow connection. So imagine how many stuff that you have on this page and how, how everything gets slowed down just because of this thing, because everything is waiting for the next connection to clear up. So the solution for this was switching to HTTP2 and making bulk requests. So in HTTP2, there are no limits to concurrent requests, so you can make them at the same time as long as the bandwidth allows to or allows for it. And another thing we did was that we uh, we took identical requests and we reused them so the response would be shared. So for example, we had two widgets which were making the same network call um, to the same endpoint even. And they wanted, and they needed uh, just different information from this same endpoint. So what we did was that we we had uh, the dashboard API uh, make this request for them, and it, would, it was a promise. So they could subscribe to this promise, and once the promise was resolved, they have they had the the results. And basically, two requests were merged into one. This was actually three, which so it was three requests merged into one. So it was very beneficial for us. So here are the same requests again. And this time they are on HTTP2. So as you can see, the, the time, the network time is exactly the same, but the stall time is now three milliseconds. So with no throttling, it was 340 milliseconds. For fast 3G, again, only a few milliseconds. So the total was six milliseconds. And the biggest change, obviously, uh, in slow 3G, Again, stalling pretty much the same. The, the network time, it didn't change, obviously. The connection wasn't faster. But the total time was now two seconds instead of being seven like it was before. This is a dramatic change. And I said it earlier in my presentation. I'll say it again and again. You need to think about your slow connections and, and customers with slow connections, whether it's mobile or in uh, developing countries. You have to to uh, make sure that the connection, uh, that you, your connection is optimized for this as much as you can. Uh, all right, so let's uh, keep going. Um, 
Okay, another problem that we that we had increased bundle size due to unique code. So um, this is actually um, a screenshot um, from a blog article that I had uh, did on Medium. Basically, I did a I did a whole uh, case study over there on how I uh, changed uh, I, I decreased the bundle size of one of our uh, widgets or it's a uh, uh, one of our uh, in the sidebar of the business manager, this progress bar, and I'll just go over it real quick. But I I noticed that this uh, in the sidebar there was this this uh, progress bar that we had, and I noticed it was loading very slowly. So I popped over uh, to the uh, analyzer, and I saw that the the size, the bundle size, was very big for such a small application. So I delved into it. And I noticed that there were two big chunks of uh, in the bundle. So one of them was Loti JS, and another one was Tutip Happy Moment JSON. And um, Loti JS is a it's a great great library, um, but it's heavy. What it does is that basically it lets uh, the designers or animators and they can make uh, these animations in uh, After Effects or Adobe. I don't know the name even the name of the tools that they use. Uh, they make these great looking animations um, and basically they they give us this JSON file and we just take this JSON file, you throw it into this Loti uh, JS library and you get this great animation uh, right in your application. Uh, but the problem was that this is heavy. Um, it's just this uh, Loti web uh, dependency was 62, almost 62 kilobytes and this JSON was even bigger. Uh, you, and you can see that the entire uh, the entire project, 190 kilobytes, dezipped, and the majority of it was because of this. So the solution was that uh, I was I was working a lot with the product on with the product managers on this, and this is actually a still screenshot. But this this is over here. This is the animated part. Okay, this is like a, it moves and there's like fireworks and stuff. So I was working a lot with the product manager and I told him about the, the, the issue and and my the main idea was that this uh, this tooltip with this animation it was shown to you only after you would complete the the entire uh, setup process for your site the entire initial process. So for example, if you were a site that had uh, only e-commerce, you needed to uh, define. Uh, your products and shipping regions and currency and how to uh, receive money and so on. And once you did all these steps that you, we recommended to you, you would get this uh, happy moment. So it was clear that we don't need to bundle this uh, all the time. And when I was working with the product manager, I told him, hey, is this critical for you? Is it okay if once he, the, the user does the final step of the setup process, that instead of this uh, to the, this happy moment appearing instantly, it would appear a second later. Is that okay with you? And he said, yeah, of course, it's not a problem as long as it's there. So this was great for me because it allowed me to use Webpack and React code splitting. What I did was basically, um, and this is brought, built right into Webpack and there's great resources about uh, in React. You can re read up on React Suspense or React Code Splitting. It's very easy to do. Basically, I split the bundle, these 190 kilobytes. I split it into several chunks. And you can see here that this is uh, the same bundle, but there's a big chunk over here. Uh, this number here, it's automatically generated by Webpack. Uh, it does all the magic for you. And you can see basically this has only the JSON and Loti. And only once the main the main bundle will need this part, it will be fetched from from the from our CDNs. And this is great because it doesn't compete with all these other client side microservices on the bandwidth. It will it will make the initial load of this uh, component much faster and will only bring it only if needed. And since since this is a once in a in a lifetime event, then there's no need to bring it over and over again all the time, especially if you're making small changes to this project. And the second chunk here 
was actually uh, more stuff which was related to this uh, tooltip. Uh, and we didn't even bring it over in case the sidebar was not supposed to render. You can see here it has popper JS and other um, Wix uh, UI elements that we didn't even need to bring if you were not eligible to see this sidebar. So after doing this code splitting and uh, using uh, Webpack, we brought down the bundle of this project to 38 kilobytes. And if you remember, we started at 190. So this was a huge difference. And, and I urge you to go to the media, uh, to the Wix blog, Wix, Wix engineering blog, where I have a full example of this and how you can do it yourself. It's very easy and simple. So some issues that we are facing forward. So first of all, it's pretty complicated, okay? Um, adding a new widget to that platform was very complicated. Um, you needed to uh, create uh, another project, you needed to have uh, this uh, component wrapper, and you needed to, uh, to have a direct dependency for that in, your, in the dashboard and call that part of the code. And this was a lot of stuff to do, especially for a new developer who doesn't know the ecosystem so much. It was complicated. Another issue that we had was the disappearing skeleton. Um, this is a screenshot here, basically showing that there are potentially going to be uh, something like 10 uh, widgets that are going to appear on screen. And this is problematic because once it started uh, loading, uh, several widgets would realize that, hey, this user is not eligible to see this widget because he didn't do ABC or there is not enough data or whatever. And then basically a lot of the widgets would disappear. So this was the same. I took two screenshots, uh, second one after another. You can see that I ended up with um, five widgets, but initially I, it looked like I was going to render 10. So this was a bad experience and we wanted to solve that as well. Uh, another problem, problem that we had was uh, blocking breaking dependencies. So the, because of these lazy components wrappers, which were uh, bundled into the dashboard, even though they were small, they created a dependency between these projects. And what that meant was that if widget A, for example, if that build was breaking uh, because of some issue, it meant that this build of the dashboard could not start because it said, hey, I have a broken dependency. So this was also problematic. And this is when we started to work on dashboard uh, v3. And so first of all, um, regarding um, the disappearing widgets, basically, uh, instead of having all these widgets bundled into the dashboard and then trying to load themselves, what we did was that we defined these widgets in an internal CMS that we have, we told the dealer. And this dealer is a server. Uh, it has a UI, which is very easy to understand for product managers as well. And I'm saying, I said that because the product managers, basically they would define the exposure of these widgets. And it's, it has, doesn't have any code, for them it's a very simple UI. For example, um, here we have, um, you can see we have the site details and only setup and the blog. And you can see, and it's very easy for um, for the product manager uh, to to decide exactly uh, what is going to be the exposure rule and who's going to be the audience of this widget. So, for example, here, only show this widget if this uh, feature toggle is is true, and only if this bi property is greater or equal to some other value. So this was really great because for us, uh, it meant that we didn't need to mess with this anymore as developers. And all the responsibility was on the product managers, and that code uh, was not bundled anymore into the into the dashboard itself. So the widgets, the the code part was basically done by the widgets themselves. They would register before the business manager would load. They would register. There was an API that we exposed um, from the dashboard API, and they would run this code called register widgets, and they would supply um, the, the, the widget ID, which will, had to be shared, the same widget ID which was supplied over here in the dealer. So that was the connecting link between these two processes. Um, the URL where to fetch the bundle from, 
and the URL where to, where to fetch the data from. Um, so what it did was it completely removed the build dependencies. We, as the dashboard, we don't even know which widgets uh, are going to be shown. Uh, there is no dependency there at all. Actually, the bundle size of uh, the dashboard became smaller because we don't need to bundle in it all these different uh, lazy components. And because the calculation of the layout was done in the server, in the dealer server, it meant that we didn't have uh, disappearing skeletons anymore. Uh, if we got a response from from the dealer that said, uh, okay, you need to render, you have here is site details widget, we knew that we need to render a site details widget. We don't need to we don't need to run some code and then see if it needs to show or not. Um, again, the data from the widget itself was fetched only for relevant widgets, so it was freeing up the network as well. We didn't need to have some widget uh, do a call to another server to check the data that it received from it and see and see if uh, it needs to show itself or hide itself. So it freed up the network even more. Uh, one of the biggest changes that we did was that we uh, we stopped allowing promises. Um, basically, in the old architecture, we we let these lazy components basically uh, uh, basically define a promise that they that would run and they it would fetch the data from the server or whatever else they wanted to calculate. And basically, the result from this promise, the resolvement of it would be passed as props to the lazy component, um, which was great at the beginning, but later it became a problem as some widgets, uh, basically it gave them the ability to kind of abuse this and they would do kind of like a promise all and they would do many fetches and many calculations. And basically it would weigh heavily on the client side and create more problems there uh, with the uh, competition on the bandwidth. So what we did was we said no more promises from now on, just a URL, and we'll do a get request to this URL. Whatever comes as the response from this uh, URL will pass uh, to the, as props to the lazy component. And what this uh, did basically, it forced the developers um, to have uh, to utilize stuff like the serverless or their own regular servers to do uh, the heavy lifting. So instead of having a widget uh, do like a promise all into four different URLs, combine the data over there in the client and then send it back uh, to the widget, we would do one request from the client to a server or serverless endpoint. It would make uh, RPCs or basically a remote procedure calls between all these servers. So it's very, very fast calls uh, and in, uh, in, in between server to server. So it's very fast, only a few milliseconds. And it got all the information there, crammed it all together, and then passed it back to the client. So it was much faster, and it didn't. It meant that only a widget could have a maximum of one AJAX call to bring the data. Um, so to summarize, um, when you're thinking about uh, complex client side or frameworks uh, and micro front end microservices, you need to consider what's good to share. So for example, design, behaviors, common code and packages. And you need to, to think what's not good to share, what you actually want to break apart and, and, and take uh, away from each other. For example, the skeletons here, one big repo. So it will it will help you, and it's a process. I we really urge you to to look over uh, the process we went through, and we're still going through it. Where we keep optimizing and optimizing and optimizing all the time, and we keep thinking of ways uh, of stuff that we can do better all the time. Uh, some of these slides are relatively new, and I didn't have them. Um, the first time I did this presentation uh, almost uh, half a year ago, uh, because we keep learning stuff and we keep uh, tweaking everything to make it as fast as possible. Great. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining. Um, I hope you had a great time. Uh, again, uh, here is uh, my Twitter account. Thank you all for joining. And see you on the next uh, Wix Engineering uh, Meetup. Bye-bye, be safe, and uh, be healthy, and stay home.